everyone. Welcome back to the Earth on Survival Guide, the podcast for all disciplines, paths, players, and game masters. With your questers, Josh and Dan. I am Dan. I am Josh. And on today's podcast, we will be discussing all things thanatological and galemical, because we're going to talk about some horror constructs. This has been a long time coming. So if you have any questions about anything, please contact us at edsgpodcast at gmail.com. Josh, do you have a quick little rundown for us on the horror constructs we're going to talk about? Sure, yeah. We're going to start off with horror constructs, or uh, what uh, was coined in Mystic Paths in the Horror Stalker essay as Horror Spawn, which actually includes both horror constructs and horrors themselves as a nice little catch-all term for things that can be affected by this because it takes up less space than saying horrors and horror constructs every time that you need to (laughs) refer to things in the rules. But these are opponents, adversaries, creatures, things that you are a little bit more likely to run into as an adventurer. Horrors themselves tend to be largely set up as more significant story arc and long-term opponents where you can use constructs as fodder, minions, sort of lesser obstacles, quote unquote, obstacles and opposition (laughs) in the course of a story. And these can more easily be dropped into places where it can help set the mood as an indication for what kind of environment that you are dealing with. Uh, If you've got an area that is corrupted or cursed or has been afflicted by a horror in the past, but you don't want to actually bring in a horror, dropping in horror constructs of some sort, especially ones that might be thematically appropriate to whatever you've got going on, can be a really nice way to kind of up the creep factor a little bit. So we're going to be going through the constructs that are in the fourth edition GM's guide. Yeah. We're just going to be going through them alphabetically, kind of providing a little bit of development insight and some thoughts and suggestions and stuff, talking about notable powers and abilities whenever relevant, but we're not going to be going into the finer details of like all of the numbers and stuff like that. Yeah, no need to crunch numbers, but I I figured we'd lay this out kind of like a a video game boss fight. You fight all the minions and, as as Josh said, the cannon fodder first. You fight all the henchmen, and then maybe you get to the sub-boss. So the big, big boss way in the background that you should almost never get to, the named horror, we'll get to those later. So we have to tease you a little bit with this episode here. Uh, But yeah, to Josh's point, we'll get to these uh, alphabetically. So beginning with the nine-foot-tall eight-legged insect with barbed spikes everywhere, the Black Mantis. My question for Josh is, is this based on the enchilada? And no, I did not mispronounce the word enchilada, Mexican food, the enchilada insect spirit, uh, or not spirit, but insect. Uh, So Black Mantis, enchilada. That is certainly something that is theorized (laughs) in the fourth edition GM's guide, but... That is a sort of later modification to the lore. The Black Mantis actually originally appeared first in Terror in the Skies, the first edition adventure, the the second adventure that was released for Earthdawn. And so chronologically, it was published before the Serpent River book, which is where the Inshalata shows up. But both of them are big, fast, nasty, dangerous insect creatures of some sort. Well, yeah. I mean, you got a nine foot tall insect. That's uh, nothing to sneeze at. (laughs) Right. As has sort of happened, there's been a little bit of power creep, I guess is the most applicable term for it when it comes to fourth edition. Terror in the Skies was originally kind of designed and, and released as a low circle adventure. Yeah, But it and uh, Mists of Betrayal both kind of, I think, maybe suffer a little bit in that the system balance may not have been understood as well as it is these days. Mm -hmm. And so there were enemies and opposition in both of those adventures that tended to be 
kind of out of whack when it came to what player characters would conceivably be able to handle based on the numbers that would be available to them at those lower circles. Yeah. What happened, and this isn't just in fourth edition, but I think you will see the same thing in third if you go in and look up the numbers. I didn't bother beforehand, but that the sort of relative challenge rating of many of these constructs are going to end up being a little bit higher than where they were back in the first edition days. The Black Mantis is scaled, uh, sort of marked in the fourth edition GM's guide as a a journeyman, a, a high journeyman, sort of equivalent eighth circle challenge with defense ratings in the mid teens, a pretty high initiative, very fast, like high movement rate, decent um, attacks. It's got multiple attacks, hardened armor. So it's even tougher to pierce its tough carapace. It's stealthy stride. It actually uh, has karma as some of the more powerful horror constructs do. And it also can, as most of the horror constructs that have karma have an ability called harvest energy, which allows them to sort of siphon karma or to regain karma by successfully doing things to their opponents. So the Black Mantis is is a nasty, fast, tough, difficult, high damage dealing and high damage absorbing opponent. It has kind of a little bit of... Um, I would almost say perhaps a little bit like alien vibe, like xenomorph kind oh, of vibes totally. a little bit. Like it doesn't have the like the acid blood or anything, but doesn't you've got it. something <laughs> that is, yeah, very fast, very damaging, multiple attacks. This is... Well, and Great Leap. Yeah, I mean, you know, Great Leap. There is a weakened version of the Black Mantis that shows up in one of the Legends of Barsave adventures. Mm-hmm where the player characters are kind of sent into the the northern catacombs after something, and there's a Black Mantis that they encounter. But its numbers are tuned down, obviously, to be appropriate for a uh, the, the low circle groups that we expect in the Legends of Barsave games. But yeah, the Black Mantis is kind of cool, kind of scary. And uh, because of their black shells and their high armor ratings and high armor resistance because of their hardened armor, which reduces the amount of extra damage you do on extra successes. They are a very nasty, like combat heavy opponent. Yeah. Eight circle journeyman. Yeah. The, the journeyman love. Yeah. Yeah. I remember using these in terror of the skies and the par length box set as well. So, but like I said, a weakened, I can't say watered down version, but yeah, not quite as, um, enhanced, or buffed as they have become in fourth edition. So that will be interesting to revisit. They also have ambush, which is a nasty power that provides a bonus to its initiative attack and damage tests if they attack from surprise. So speaking of the xenomorph it? vibe. <laughs> yeah. Between between ambush really, and like senses that... and great leap and hardened armor. <laughs> and it's ambush 10. Which means Step that's 10? the yeah. bonus that it's that's the bonus that it provides to initiative attack and damage when it strikes from ambush from surprise. Wow, adding ten steps to any of that is just horrendous. <laughs> yeah, to the already pretty <laughs> high numbers that it's uh, yeah. that it's got there. So this is a you know this is a this is a nasty um, nasty nasty creature. I can hear about a dozen people taking notes on. I should use that soon. Okay, onto the bone shambler. Because this is an undead construct made from a pile of bones collected from other victims. So basically it's a rolling ball of bones. So it's a meatball with hard stuff sticking out of it, maybe. Uh (laughs) It's a giant meatball with bony spikes that basically runs into you and sometimes runs over you. Which I... Uh, It is lost to time i think at this point now mm-hmm. but the um the legends of earth dawn actual play show yeah there was a bone shambler that showed up early in that and i think the bone shambler like killed somebody or came very close to killing somebody mm-hmm. very early on but it is another sort of big tough 
combat-y type creature. This one is more weird undead because of its bone nature. And so statistically, like it's kind of similar in terms of its numbers to the Black Mantis. Black Mantis? Um, yeah. It's not quite as fast and it doesn't have quite as many actions, but it is kind of as tough and it also has karma. It has the advantage of uh, as undead uh, resist pain. So wounds don't do anything to it. It's immune to fear. And if it rolls well enough on its attack, it's going to actually like run you over and do even more damage. So this is one that where you would use if you're like going with a bit more of an undead flavor or style or as opposed factor. to the Black Mantis. Yeah, Creepy. just because I can imagine uh, for those Foley artists out there, I-, I could imagine the sickening, ghastly noise that this meat bone sludge rolling over the landscape yeah and it's also coming got at you bits of armor and stuff from the bodies that it's made out of included in there so there will be like metal and whatnot it's like this kind of clicking ratcheting squeaking nasty kind squishy. of thing <laughs> yeah between the clicking of the bones and the squishing of the meat and the little you know pings of armor that you occasionally get on there i would just me as a game master, I'm this kind of guy. I would grab, I would find noises to mix together and play that and say, yeah, you hear this on its way. And so anytime I would ever revisit this creature, the bone chambler, as soon as I would make play that noise, I would love to see the faces of my players go, Oh no, no, it's on now. Uh, and just, you know, get ready for the fight. But that's me. This is still a nasty opponent. (laughs) I don't think it's quite as nasty physically as the black mantis. But yeah. it's still pretty nasty. And if it does get its sort of overrun trample ability, it knocks people over and does like extra damage. And that can be pretty, pretty rough. Oh, I love the special maneuver momentum killer. Oh, yeah. If they avoid being knocked down, they can mm-hmm. choose to take damage to stop the bone shambler's movement and knock it down in return. That's- Oh, like a fire hydrant. You just can't move it. <laughs> yeah. Stan stalwart that way. So, yeah, I can just imagine the creepy factor of the bone shambler and somebody has to use noise to introduce that. You just have to. I think it, I think it calls for it. On to one of... Yeah, it first appeared in the um, Parlength box set where nice. several of the things we're going to be talking about, um, if they didn't appear earlier, appeared in Parlength. Absolutely. On to one of Josh's favorites and one of my favorites as well, the Cadaver Man. One of everybody's favorites, to be <laughs> honest. The Cadaver Man is... It's an Earth Dawn stalwart. A staple of Earth Dawn. It is the Earth Dawn version of the zombie. We've talked about how getting players who are new to Earth Dawn but familiar with traditional fantasy gaming, whether D&D or something else zombies tend to be like, oh, these are like a low-powered walking corpse kind of thing. Yeah. No big deal. The cadaver men are notable in Earth Dawn for a couple of different reasons. One, for the most part, it is actually intended that they retain some semblance of their personality or memory. They're not just mindless husks. They are people that have been animated by a horror, returned yeah. to uh, unliving status, to undead status by a horror, but retain enough of a semblance of themselves to suffer as a result of it. And yeah. so depending on how you want to handle them, they can be talked to. A lot of them are on the verge of madness or a little bit off in some way, as you would expect. But notably, there is an entire kingdom of cadaver men down in the eastern catacombs of Parlanth, led by Twiceborn, who, you know, have this whole kind of society that is going on. Also, there is a little bit of information that can be gleaned. There are a couple of cadaver men that are uh, in the adventure infected. Yes. That it's possible to maybe gain a little bit of information from them because again, they sort of retain memories and whatnot. So these are, you know, a little bit more 
uh, to talk about sort of Fallout, maybe kind of draw the parallel there. They're kind of like the ghouls in Fallout being like the the radioactive wasteland dwellers that are kind of like undead and creepy looking, but do have minds and personalities and are able mm-hmm. to be dealt with appropriately. But they can yeah. also be really unpleasant. The other notable thing, and this is the part that most game masters really like about Cadaver Men and why they like springing them on newer players. When they suffer a wound, Cadaver Men go into a frenzy. Yeah. They gain additional attacks. Their attack and damage steps go up. Yeah, they they go from one attack per turn to four attacks per turn. Yeah, they (laughs) enter a rage, they enter a frenzy, they frequently start doing aggressive attacks. And so because they don't tend to actually wear much in the way of armor... It's actually can be a situation where the group can unintentionally cause themselves a lot of grief by wounding them. Because of the actual nastiness of the extra attacks and the extra damage that they can do, they tend to be, they were sort of scaled up in terms of their relative difficulty level when it comes to third and fourth edition. First edition, they were kind of like, Legend pointed out as being like introductory Mm -hmm. opposition when it comes to undead, but the extra attacks and the extra damage that they can do as a result of that actually makes them potentially a a little bit tougher in that regard. The best tactic against cadaver men is to gang up on them, basically try and take each individual cadaver man down as quickly as you can, especially if you have wounded one, because... When you get multiple ones that are wounded, uh, things can turn bad very, very quickly. Yes. And just a reminder, these are zombies. So like typical zombie rules, uh, they will eat flesh, living flesh. Uh, It's not necessary for them to do so, but it adds to that little creep factor that the horrors usually like to have for uh, player characters to come across. So, I mean, they can, Mm -hmm. but they don't really they're undead. They're they are animated by horror magic and are no yeah. longer really subject to th- requirements of the sustenance. needs of the flesh. Yeah. Um, we'll get to the the flesh eating ones <laughs> a little bit here. Yeah, but cadaver men are do you know while they sort of superficially resemble traditional zombies, they are they are not zombies. They are worse yeah. in <laughs> several in ways, way. <laughs> in several wonderful ways. Exactly. Especially for the game masters out here who are going to use them. So the next one we're going to get to is also based upon the men part and not necessarily gender specific. This is a group of false men, which I'm pretty sure were introduced in the Parlinth box set. Am I, am I wrong? Yeah, that's, that's where they first showed up, at okay. least as far Fair. as I recall. So the false men were created by the Therans as automatons, as mindless Gollums. servants. Yeah, golems, yeah. basically, but without carrying that baggage. Oh, fair, yeah. Because there is a there is a cultural history to actual golems. golems. Agreed, and agreed. whatnot. But yeah, false men, that, that these are animated statues that were used as servants by the Therans, particularly in par length. Um, they, they never really kind of showed up elsewhere, but there are sort of four different levels of them, kind of similar to the way that there were different types of golems in, in D and D. Yeah. You know, you've got the, the really basic, uh, straw men and wax men. These are made of straw and wax respectively. They Duh. are <laughs> low powered, minor, super easy, novice challenges and y- They work really, really well to provide a whole, like if you want to provide a whole bunch of low powered opposition that you can have a group hack through without feeling any kind of remorse because (laughs) they're just basically carving up animated bits of material. Straw men are vulnerable to fire. Wax men are as well because, you know, straw burns and wax melts. But generally speaking, these are mindless autonomous things. It's animated stuff. Yeah, animated stuff. They are mostly appear in par length these days, sort of in the present day of the game, as yeah. cannon fodder in the war games of the war zone. 
yeah. that's in the western portion of Parlength. The horrors basically animated um, and learned how to sort of make more straw men and wax men and basically just kind of use them to play their battles against each other and have kind of warped them and programmed them to be generally like violent and aggressive and whatever. Yeah, they're built for entertainment. You can sometimes find ones in the ruins that might not have been corrupted and are still sort of in service of whatever, if theoretically, whatever master might have created them, whatever Theron magician and whatnot. But generally, they're just low powered obstacles that don't have any brains of their own to speak of. They can kind of follow simple instructions, but for the most part, they're nothing major. Yeah. And for. I was going to say, and for a real world uh, a symbol, uh, symbolism, really, I look at scarecrows and cornfields as your straw yeah. men. And then I look at uh, Ma- Madame Tussaud's wax museum for your wax men. Kind of. <laughs> yeah, Not I mean, that that's, far, that's sort of saying. an idea. I, yeah. yeah, I don't know that they would be that finely crafted. Um, the picture yeah. of the wax men that kind of shows up in the It looks like book. Clayface from Batman. So, yeah. yeah. <laughs> like a humanoid thing of melted wax. Yeah, like clay face, so. that is a really good description. I had a feeling that would be better, but yes. Then you've got sort of the upper tier of false men, the stone men and the steel men. These are journeyman tier opposition. And these are much more finely crafted, and the enchantments in them are sort of more are, are superior. They have personalities, maybe a little <laughs> bit of a stretch. <laughs> a little bit. But they actually do you have they have an attitude how's that they have an attitude they have a, a a like maybe an emotion or a concept that they are really strongly connected to and they are frequently the officers and commanders of the various factions in the warzone games and occasionally you can find them in other parts of the ruins. Um, but they are works of art. They are very finely crafted. They are very valuable. If you are able to defeat one or destroy one, then you can often use the salvage from it as artwork that could fetch you uh, money from somebody, some interested collectors that might be interested in, in taking pieces of it, but also legend points for downing opposition like that. The horrors reportedly never bothered to create more of these so in theory there are limited numbers of them i would really look at games of the hungry i think is the name of it one of the legends of bar save adventures that revolves around the war zone and uh the different factions and the uh the commanders of them the cover if you've got the individual issue no yeah has games, a false games man of on the, the cover games of the hungry games of the hungry you're good in the the online game that i was running last year and and into the beginning of this year, that was a very popular adventure. And they kind of uh, started referring to the, the, the false men, especially the, the officers as robots, (laughs) robot war games, stone robots. Hmm. (laughs) But yeah, having, having like kind of super simple programming, they have things that they are sort of intended to do and have been twisted by the horrors to have these objectives, but they also can, theoretically be reasoned with if you can find something that will further their objectives then you might be able to work with them in a limited fashion yeah and all stone men by the way have a stone weapon which every single time i've thrown at my party uh, when they finally defeat the thing somebody's walking off with that stone weapon because it does some serious damage secondly uh the steel men are almost always uh, a, a, a full suit of plate armor They are very cunning. They are very dangerous. So just so everybody knows. So they've got really high armor. They've got pretty significant health ratings, you know, high death rating, high wound threshold. None of the false men can be knocked unconscious because they're not living creatures in the first place. Fair. But they're pretty nasty. And, And they're all, again, immune to fear, resist pain, like the kinds of things that affect normal name givers do not phase them pretty much at all. Yes, a whole whole slew of different tactics you have to use there. But these were all created by a ritual magic, from mostly from the Therans, as you were correct, uh, if not the Therans and Horrors. They, uh, the Horrors have corrupted them. Uh, so the, like Josh said, rudimentary intelligence, maybe uh, a, a thought process or a single command or a emotion that they're going to go with. 
but they can have a karma pool that is sh- a shared karma step with the horrors. So whatever horror constru- whatever horror has them under its command, the uh, the false men, any of the versions, pretty much have the same karma step as that horror. So that yeah. might be something to take a look at as well. That we- in that case, what you would be looking at is rather than the sort of generic false men that are fighting in the war zone or that you're encountering in other places. This is a case where a horror would have like specific minions that it is watching over them and kind of acting through them in a way to yeah. grant its karma to them. So there's two different versions of each one of these. So you've got four of the eight, you have eight really different versions you can throw at people. So have fun with those. That'll be a good time for you. Uh, on to ghouls. These are not very, <laughs> these are not very sentient. <laughs> no, these are the flesh eaters that I was referring to earlier. Yes. Had to get to them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. These are uh, another undead construct. In this case, unlike cadaver men, they don't retain any traces of the the personality that might have been in them as an animating force before. They are sort of animalistic, feral pack animals, in a sense, that run around and feast on flesh. Um, this is sort of the, the more traditional definition of a ghoul um, in, in that sense. Again, another creature that has a long history in fantasy role-playing games, but the Earthon version has the slight twist of it that rather than paralysis, which is the common special attack of the ghoul in D&D, mm-hmm. Earthon ghouls have a venom, a magical venom, that when they successfully injure a target could potentially infect them and does damage. In the original version of it, the damage actually did like specific amounts each round yeah. until it ran out to align them with the way that we, we that we reworked poisons in 4th edition. We just kind of gave it numbers and it and it works the same way as other poisons. The thing is that the poison goes inert when the ghoul that injected it is killed. So if somebody does based. get injured by a ghoul and is suffering from the poison, uh, what you'll want to do is try and take that ghoul out as quickly as possible because it is a nasty venom that they have uh, mm-hmm. that can do quite a bit of damage. But for ghouls, since Josh said they travel in packs, uh, be aware of your rules on being harried. Yep, they do tend to travel in packs. Individual ghouls aren't that dangerous. They're only sort of a second circle challenge. But when you get notable numbers of them and, you know, when you start dealing with things like harried and just the sheer number of rolls that can be made, a larger pack of ghouls can be a hazard even to higher circle, you know, higher novice or lower journeyman, especially when it comes to the poison, because it doesn't take too many hits for the poison to come into effect and then everybody starts hurting even more. And and that's rough. Also included in the GM's guide is a slightly more powerful ghoul called the ghoul leader. Um, this is uh, basically has a, a little bit higher step numbers. The, for lack of a better term, like a commander mm-hmm. of, of a pack of ghouls. This, of course, was sort of developed before the masks were introduced in the companion. Yeah. Uh, and one thing you can actually look at in the companion Uh, We talked about the cadaver men. There is a mask that you can use to put onto any normal animal or whatever to make it a sort of cadaver version of that creature. So that's something to to also keep in mind if you want to change things up, you know, like taking your your standard wolves and throwing a cadaverous mask on them to make them sort of animated undead wolves with the same kind of powers and abilities that the cadaver man has can also show that a forest region or some kind of wilderness area has been corrupted or, or affected by a horror. Nicely done. On to uh, one of my personal favorites, and I think something that was introduced back in uh, Mist of Betrayal at the very least, Jehuthra. Yeah, the Jehuthra does appear as one of the first encounters in Mist of Betrayal. It actually appeared in the Earthdawn first edition core book. Oh, totally. Um, it was in the creatures chapter in, in that book. This is a construct that's kind of like a giant spider thing seven seven feet long ten foot legs and a name giver head 
Right, because generally <laughs> these things have been transformed into what they are from a name giver, commonly a larger name giver like a troll or a, an orc or something. Mm -hmm. But any name giver really can be converted into this by a horror. And they are nasty. Um, the fact that there were two of them in that first encounter in Miss of Betrayal. Yeah. Again, balance issues potentially in terms <laughs> of the numbers. They're creepy as any kind of like spider creation frequently is. Um, they've got a couple of notable powers. Indeed. They basically have some some minor spellcasting ability. Frostweb allows them to entangle an opponent in an icy web, which holds them fast and also causes damage um, and wraps the, the target up and prevents them from moving. Is that new for fourth edition? Because remember the iron web. No, no, no. They they had the frost web before. Okay. It might have had a slightly different name, but they had the they had the, the two powers. They had the frost one. And then they have the iron web. And iron yeah. web is one where they target a group and create a maze that separates all of the characters that are trapped within it in their own passageways. And it's kind of a maze where all of the passages lead to the center. And typically what happens is that the Jehuther will scuttle down one of the, the passages to go after and basically be able to pick off individuals that are isolated from their friends. One of the other issues is that the walls of the web are spiky. So you kind of need to move slowly through it. Otherwise, you might injure yourself on the spikes if you move faster. If there's ever an Earth Dawn movie, this has to be on screen somewhere. Yeah. Just and so. again, they have karma. They've got the ambush ability, though not as high as the Black Mantis. They're not quite as physically intimidating as the Black Mantis, but their magical abilities can make them a very difficult opponent to deal with. Yeah. They're kind of a staple, like, unique Earth Dawn creature Absolutely. on their own. That was one of the first selling points is that I, I, I threw Jehuthra, because we were playing Mr. Betrayal. I threw the Jehuthra at everybody. They're kind of like, oh, this is a different game than we were expecting. Yes. Yes, it is. And the yes. Cavermen and the Jehuthra completely set that tone of, you're not playing your typical, what you thought, fantasy game. This is Earth Dawn. Those are the two I can point to. These are the ones that kind of bring in that horror element into play as something that is a little bit a little bit darker a little bit twisted you know a little bit more of that aspect of the the genre yeah so uh last note on jehutha the not very sentient but they are incredibly cunning so you as the game master play them as such they they build those webs for a reason they corral people they isolate them so they have tactics to use on to plagues these are really only contained by quarantine and anybody who's been through, I don't know, the last two years on earth <laughs> kind of understands what quarantine's about, but otherwise just I, not even, not even kidding. These are tall, very gaunt humanoids with blotches and blisters. They reek of decay. And if you've ever smelled meat going bad, go with that in your image in your head. However, plagues are very tough. They are very quick but they carry disease and it also does spread after death. Like, you know, disease. <laughs> the thing with a plague is that unlike the other creatures that we have talked about thus far, the other constructs, which all for the most part are kind of physical challenges, combat challenges. The plague is kind of tough, but not super tough as far as a, a physical combatant goes. It's, creep factor and its danger comes from its ability to infect and spread disease. And quite frequently, they have some uh, illusion abilities that allow them to operate unseen or unnoticed or whatever as they infiltrate an area and spread the sickness that they carry in order to cause problems for settlements. And so a, a, a plague can serve a, a couple of purposes for lower powered characters, because the plague is sort of scaled out as a, as a low level journeyman threat, maybe mid to, to upper novice tier. The plague could kind of serve as the capstone opposition, where the group comes into an area and 
investigates and finds out that a plague is operating and needs to find out where it might be holed up and track it down and, and kill it and put a stop to it. The other way, and these sort of can be tied to each other if you're looking at it as a longer term campaign arc potentially, is that a plague could be sent into an area by a horror looking to cause problems in the area and to destabilize and feed on the pain and uncertainty Fear. and suffering that is a result of the disease that's being spread. Yeah, I can see that. And and for sort of higher powered characters, you might see a plague or plagues multiple as minions of a horror that is kind of spreading disease and distrust and suffering, uh, you know, uh, and fear through an area that way. Completely. Uh, I love the fact that you can probably, if you introduce the undead aspect correctly, you could almost confuse the players to say, if you describe the plague, they might think it's a cadaver man and approach it that way and be completely off thrown off guard when it's not actually a cadaver man. It is a plague. And so if they contract the disease later on, you know, you've given them a nice little twist on that. Yeah. So the other thing is, is that because it's a disease as opposed to poison, it's slower acting and it's possible that the, the group might not realize that they are infected mm -hmm. by it if they sort of have an encounter with it until later. It's got a it's an it's onset of the disease is three to five days. So it's certainly something that that takes time to develop. And to show before the, the symptoms manifest and, and they realize that they might be in trouble. What? Like COVID? <laughs> I will not comment. <laughs> Just saying. Anyway, uh, on to one of my favorite things to try and pronounce, because I it took me forever and a day to learn how to pr pronounce this one. The Kuarl Lotectica, which I think made its first debut in one of the Earth Dawn journals. That is correct. Yay me! I am... This is... This is Andrew Ragland's 99% certain to that this is one of Andrew's oh, yeah. creatures. This is Andrew Ragland's baby. I guarantee it. Um, that first showed up in an Earth Dawn journal. One of the early ones, too. I don't remember exactly like three which or issue or offhand. something like that, yeah. Then made the transition to official mm -hmm. in the Horrors source book. Yes. As one of the things that was, uh, that yeah, was there. there. Yep, it's in there. It's kind of a blob with tentacles. Yeah. And the tentacles like have hooks on the end and they stab into people and drink its blood. Yeah. It's got this bulbous body with uh, 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 just a tentacles that drapes from trees to imitate like hanging yeah. vines. So in case you want to know how to use it, that's kind of where people would encounter it. It's it's more of like a, a, a plant horror spawn almost. Yeah. In that it disguises itself and hides in the jungles or forest areas and snacks on people as a result of encounters with it that way. It doesn't really have much in the way of any particular like sentience or cunning. I mean, it can move. It is animate, but it tends to just kind of hang out and stab things and drink their blood. It's Yeah, it's, it's kind of a cross between a jellyfish and an octopus. <laughs> yeah, with with a little bit of like Venus flytrap kind of energy going for it because of the whole plant jungle camouflage thing. Totally. Uh, in the long tradition of fantasy tradition of dangerous plants. Yes. Uh, has a paralytic poison, as Josh said, drains the blood of its victims and is very, very, very feared among the Cathan tribesmen uh, and anybody else in the, the jungle slash forest setting. So more, more jungle, less forest. Sorry. It's not particularly dangerous on its own unless it gets its venom into you because its paralytic venom is really nasty. Yeah. And can paralyze you. And if it can paralyze you, then it's going to likely drink you dry. This is almost a like an environmental obstacle. The other thing that comes to mind for it are the um, the barnacles from Half-Life, mm. which are like the alien things that that cling to the ceiling and have the tentacles that drips down. Yeah, that the like sticky thing. And if you run into them, it grabs you and kind of pulls you up and, and chomps on you. Mm -hmm. um, it's got that kind of vibe to it. It, it's sort of like an ambush surprise environmental type obstacle. Yeah. Because it doesn't move very quickly. Even climbing, it's only got a, a movement rate of four. And so it gets its prey by lurking and ambushing them, not by chasing them down. Yeah. It's, it's like if you happen to 
come across it like you would a jellyfish in the ocean. It's not actively seeking to get you, but if you just happen to graze its tentacles, yeah, you're in trouble. Yeah. So if we're going to be talking about some like classic monster <laughs> parallels and whatnot, it doesn't have like the disguise aspects, like in terms of the actual impersonation of like the mimic. Yeah. But it is a similar kind of creature that it waits in a place for prey to come by and then it stabs it and yeah, it's a, its, it's a camouflaged uh, predator. Anyway, uh, on to, so we got a couple more to get to. The Spectral Dancer, which I am pretty sure was in the original uh, first edition book. Yes. But I encountered- It also it, appeared in Miss of Betrayal. That's what I was going to say, is that's the, the end-all, be-all, last thing you encounter usually. I suspect, and this actually would be an interesting question for Lou, because I know that Miss of Betrayal was sort of developed in tandem with the core book yeah. as the first adventure, is- whether the Jehuthra and the Spectral Dancer were created for that adventure and dropped into the player's guide or whether – or into the, the core book or whether they were kind of developed as part of the bestiary for the core book and they decided to use them in this initial adventure because of their sort of unique status. Yeah, which came first, chicken or egg? Yeah. In that, in that regard. The Spectral Dancer is an undead. It is – Created from individuals typically who had very high personal charm and charisma, but they are ghostly. They are spirits in a sense, um, trapped in a sort of uh, static state where they can't really interact particularly well or sense very well the, the natural world, the, the regular world. They are frequently female, but they don't have to be. They are frequently tor they are tormented by their lack of connection to the physical world uh, you know, despite their their desire to do so, they are kind of dangerous in that the way to deal with them is to kind of break their curse by connecting with them. And unfortunately, the way that you do that is by engaging them in a in a dance. It, when you are dancing with it, you make tests and you need to succeed or accumulate, a, you know, you, you need to kind of succeed in doing this over a period of time in order to assuage their torment and break the curse and, and have them go away, but you suffer damage while you're doing it. Mm -hmm. They are nasty and uh, they have a moderately high social defense in the first place, which is what you need to target in order to get through to them. Troubadours can handle them reasonably well because they tend to have ways of, of boosting their social stuff. But other disciplines can can have a rough go of it. They, of course, also have the ability to like, you know, spirit grip and spirit dart are sort of powers that they have. They can they can cast spells Ow. and they're insubstantial. So it is very difficult to physically damage them. Yeah, because they're they have an incorporeal body. Yes. Yeah. And and just figuring out that you have to dance with them is the hard part <laughs> because that doesn't come naturally as a solution to handle something of this nature. You're either trying to fight it or spell cast it at, or something along those lines or charisma, but dancing is kind of like way down your list of, well, let's try this option. Let's try that option. Dancing. Great. It's the last thing we haven't tried yet. Yeah. <laughs> this is another of like the interesting not quite as iconic in a way as the as the cadaver man or the or the Jehuthra are yeah. when it comes to interesting horror constructs, but also very different in that it is best dealt with not by bashing it with weapons, but yes. by trying to make that connection with this tormented spirit. It's a neat idea and something that I think differentiates Earth Dawn or makes Earth Dawn stand out a little bit in its own way when it comes to this. I agree, because it's uh... As I said from the very beginning, I love Earthdawn because it not only had a physical defense and a spell defense, originally not mystic defense, but a social defense. And so this is the this is the creature that you look at and go, you have to solve this socially. And that is the Earthdawn, you know, twist on things. Not every problem is most easily <laughs> solved by sticking sharp bits of metal into something. Exactly. Or, you know, umbly, umbly, umbly go away, um, you know casting your spell so but the spectral dancer usually only speaks in garbled howls so um again sound engineers play that for your for your party just just have some fun with some sound and bring some some new wrinkles into your that one is probably a little bit easier you can find i'm sure plenty of open source or free like 
ghostly moaning <laughs> kind of stuff, especially as we are getting into Halloween, uh, oh, the, yeah. the Halloween season here in the latter half of September and into October. Uh, there is plenty of opportunity to get that that kind of thing going. Yeah. And I can occasionally laugh like that. So one of those, if it, if it's the right joke, anyway, it's a garbled howl. Uh, lastly for today's podcast, at least, um, the storm wraith, this is a horror corrupted air elemental. It's a dark yes. humanoid shaped cloud with glowing blue eyes. Cause if that's not ominous enough, I don't know what is, uh, but this sucker is smart and it works in groups. Cause if one of them's bad, Two is worse, and three is just run for the hills. Yeah, this is, uh, it's a horror corrupted air elemental, so it's vengeful and aggressive and nasty, and it's got a bunch of air and lightning attacks, basically. Air blast, lightning bolt, shock, uh, stuff like that. So think of, like, an air spirit, and it's a nasty one. It is also insubstantial, so it is tougher to affect physically. It can grapple a target and automatically do electric damage to them. Ow. (laughs) They're nasty and they are particularly a potential problem for airships, especially mine air, air mining operations Mm -hmm. because it's easiest and most profitable to mine elemental air from storms. Mm -hmm. But of course, storms are where these things are most commonly going to appear. Yeah. Yeah. And so they are a great hazard to throw at any kind of airship travel, air mining operations, any kind of situation where you are up sort of at higher altitudes. But this is one where if you've got like an elementalist in the group, like this could be an indication that a horror has been causing problems in an area because they would have knowledge of what air spirits are normally like and stuff like that. Yeah. So, and you could sort of use this as an as an idea for how you might do horror corrupted elementals of other types as well. Just the idea of this like, you know, vengeful miniature storm with lightning attacks is pretty cool. And again, I want to see this on screen. I want to see an airship, <laughs> an Earth Dawn movie, and I want to see this sucker on screen and just the turn of events where all the people on, on the deck have to go, oh, that's what's, yeah, okay, change of tactics, here we go. I just want to see that. That's all. <laughs> I have a wish list for the Earth Dawn movie. That's all. I'll 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 write that. I mean, I have a wish time. list for an Earth Dawn movie. So yes, as let's get one. That's my whole thing. Because uh, there's a new Dungeons and Dragons movie coming out. That all right. We'll see what that does. But anyway, um, I like all ten of these. I think they are a fantastically diverse group, uh, which just indicates exactly how the horrors can corrupt everything is yep. either creepy or it's elemental or it's a spirit or it's a ghost or it's in the flesh, decaying flesh, a mound of flesh, rolling flesh, uh, and bones and just, you know, or, or an insect. I mean, the depth and breadth of twistedness on horrors is we're scratching the surface on this one. I did kind of touch briefly on the, the cadaverous mask from the companion yeah. that you can throw onto any creature to make it like a cadaver man version of that. Uh, there are some other masks as well in the companion that you would put onto something to make them sort of horror constructy or twisted in some regards. There's a group of tough ones, which makes them more muscular and tougher. And then there are other ones that make them faster and more gangly and and twisted and whatnot. And so those are masks that you could use and put them onto any other creature to warp it and shift it. This is one of the great things about masks Mm -hmm. is, you know, being able to sort of change a creature, both having sort of a a preset package of abilities and modifiers that you can just put on something to make it okay. This is an Aspagra that has been corrupted by a horror, and it is longer and twisted and more agile and nasty uh, as a result. Yeah. Or this is a Brithen that was killed and reanimated by a horror, and so it, now, it is now a cadaver Brithen. There is so much more that you can do <laughs> beyond the uh, the examples that are here, but these all serve as like a good kind of broad template, as you said, of the different styles and approaches of things that horrors uh, might want to do. Yeah, the, the sky's the limit when it comes to them, because any kind of weird horror movie monster trope 
that you might want to come up with, you can justify as the, the construct or the manipulations of a horror on some kind of natural flora, fauna, or spirit. Agreed. This is, it's nice to finally delve into the, the evil parts of, of what Earthon can present as opposition. So nice little change of pace for us to talk about. Uh, if you have any questions for us, folks, drop us a line at edsgpodcast at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at uh, anchor.fm, I believe is the, is the place to do so. So until next time, let's let these things uh, go bump in the night for you and go fight some spawn for your legend. Good night, everybody. Good night.